Hello and thank you for joining us. You're listening to a We Do Talk with David Jakes. Hi, welcome to this week's talk. And this is a little bit of a different one for me. It's a first time. I'm doing one in person, which I love to do. But I'm in London today. Um, it's end of September and uh, back in my hometown. And delighted to have joining me as a guest today, Patrick Hill, who is originally from New Zealand. But uh -huh. Patrick, you've lived in London now for almost 20 years. So yeah. this is your hometown, it's my hometown. You weren't born here, but you live here. I was born here, I don't live here. So we kind of complement each other. In We're home. Regard. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I think we are. So, uh, so Patrick is joining me today as one of the co-CEOs and a director of an organization called Mendable, which I look at as being a pioneer in the world of mental health advocacy. It's really a place for men's mental health that acknowledges and provides a space for men to share their stories and support each other. So, like I said, very much a pioneer organization in the mm. world of mental health. But um, by means of just a brief background, as I say, Patrick was born in New Zealand, a uh, former school teacher. He's made his home here in London for much of his adult life. And he now also runs his own coaching business called Thinking Beyond Now, which is a great name. I love the name too, uh, thank you. Life coaching business. And his tagline on his website is coaching people in and through the harder times. So something that's really important and I, I do believe you've had some of your own challenges in your life mm. so you can draw from experience mm. as well as from training to, to help people. So we'd love to talk to you about that as well but I'd love to really start off talking a little bit about Mendable. Yeah. So I first discovered Mendable um, when I joined a clubhouse room a few months ago now, not very long back. And I met Patrick and uh, his co-CEO and the founder, Sophia May and have had some conversations with them and I just think it's a fabulous organization. So uh, Patrick, you're the one that is more heavily involved in it than me. Sure. Would you give us an overview? What is Mendable? How did it come about? Mm -hmm. uh, what was the genesis of it? And what's your vision for it? So Mendable came about through Sophia. So she had this fantastic idea uh, to host a clubhouse room about men's mental health, a testimony kind of room where men could come in and share their experiences of mental health, um, what's happened, what they've done to overcome the difficulties and just create a safe space. And then she had this vision of an app, uh, a men's mental health app called Mendable. Um, we're definitely starting with men's mental health, but obviously it's gonna be an app for mental health. Um, the name Mendable would suggest men, we're all Mendable. Um, and that was where it began. And I, I met Sophia through Clubhouse, as did the other two uh, uh, directors. And very quickly after meeting Sophia, we had a, quite a few exchanges by email um, and through the platform of Clubhouse. And she approached me and said, look, would you be interested in, in working on this uh, with us? And so I met the other team. And what, what was really clear to me was the alignment of purpose was spot on. Mm -hmm. The four of us, uh, the, the four directors currently, it's the first time I've been involved in a startup where everyone's vision, purpose is totally aligned. Mm -hmm. There is nothing other than idea, ideas flowing, bouncing around, refining, and then actions taken to you know, achieve the next steps. Um, the mission really is about uh, changing mental health through an app because we have technology that can use metrics, measure human metrics, and then have an output and tools within the app that will help support, maintain um, mental health. And the stuff that we're working on at the moment is so exciting because it's science-based, will be one of the first science-based uh, apps out there for mental health. And yeah, it's a super exciting time. Yeah, and, and one of the things which I think is great that drew me to the Clubhouse Room is that it is a place that's starting out with men's mental health, which to me is very much an underserved community because mm -hmm. like it or not, adult men are less, and the older the adult man, the less likely they are to seek help or even right. acknowledge that they might have mm -hmm. a challenge, an issue, an yeah. illness or anything. Yeah. So, um, so creating that place and creating somewhere where there's no shame, there's no stigma to saying, I'm having difficulty, I'm having a hard time with mm -hmm. 
whatever it might be, whether it could be a situational thing. And I've listened into many of the clubhouse rooms um, on, on this um, where, you know, people could just be having a bad day and just want somewhere to be able to share that. Right. Other people can be having a very deep issue that mm. they really need to work through mm. and, and get advice on, not, if not necessarily how to deal with the issue, but just to let them know that they're not alone. And I right. think that is one of the, the core things that anybody who's suffering from any major challenge like that is, is likely to feel isolated. It's the isolation of, I am the only person in the world that's suffering from this. And that's never the case. So yeah. if, is that the aim of Mendable to get yeah, that word out there? Definitely. The, the, we know that one of the major killers when it comes to mental health is isolation. Mm -hmm. The opposite to isolation is obviously connection. So when we have uh, the app up and running, there's definitely going to be peer-to-peer -peer support available within it. Communication and interaction is key. Because when, when we're unwell with whatever mental health concern it is, humans have a natural tendency to isolate. Mm -hmm. And so what we're doing within the clubhouse room is building up a network of like-minded people who are interested and really good at just being present with others when they're having a hard time. You know, one of the key things that's great about clubhouse is uh, you have the opportunity to just listen. Mm -hmm. Because when one person's talking, you can't have someone else talking because it just doesn't work like that. And lots of the time, uh, people are listening for the gap for them to say their next thought. They're not actually just listening to be present with someone. So that's one of the beautiful things that's come out of Clubhouse is a really strong network. We have, uh, I was looking yesterday actually prepping for this, we have 8,900 members really? in, that in that club. one Clubhouse room? In that one, that one club, the Mental Health Awareness Club, right. that, uh, that room runs under, yeah, there's 8,900 people wow. connected to that. Lots of them have obviously got very interested in, in Mendable, the app. Um, and so it continues to grow and grow and grow. So we know that when the first release of the app happens, it's gonna be taken up really quickly, right. yeah. which is super exciting because that's what we're about. We're about impacting and changing lives for the better as soon as we possibly can. Because we know there's an international crisis when it comes to mental health, particularly for men and the suicide stats that go with that. And interestingly, you said just before, David, about you know there's not enough support for men um, and men aren't as readily uh, coming forward to talk about things. That's absolutely the case. And the most recent research um, that I was reading was saying that of all the helping professions, therapy, psychiatry, counseling, coaching, um, only 30% of the clients are male. Mm. So 70% female go into these helping professions. But the inverse yeah. is true for the suicide stats, roughly. Yeah. So there has to be a lot more action being taken. And this is our bit. This is our bit of doing something really purposeful uh, to change things. Because things, things must change and they're going to. Yeah. Yeah, that, and that is, that is something that I've been wanting to promote for a long time. So that's mm. why so I feel this great connection with it and, and mm. want to be really supportive. Mm. So, um, so, so Patrick, tell us a little bit about Patrick Hill. Tell okay. us a bit about your background. So right. uh, you were born in New Zealand. <laughs> I um, was. What brought you to the UK? Right, so I was born into a very Catholic family. As a gay kid growing up in a Catholic family in small town New Zealand, with an alcoholic background in our, in our home, um, it wasn't easy living. Mm. It was not. It obviously impacted my mental health significantly. Um, throw into that the mix of uh, trauma and abuse in my teenage years, my own addiction issues, life was uncomfortable. Mm. Um, it wasn't a pleasant thing at all. Fortunately, I met some right people at the right time when I was 24, and I stopped drinking and drug taking from them. So I've been sober for just over 22 years. So that's one of the things that when you look at uh, the research on mental health for any gender internationally, it goes depression, anxiety, substance abuse, mm -hmm. and alcohol abuse, and those three things. And then when you look at my story, which is sadly quite typical, alcoholism in the background, abuse, LGBT, QIA plus community, those factors yeah. are all here. Yeah. And I talk about it publicly because there are still millions of people suffering and they don't understand how much that is impacting their mental health and their lives. Yeah. I was 38 
when I really realized the full impact of all of my backstory. I'm 47 now. Yeah. 38 years of living like I did. It wasn't really living, David. It was surviving. Yeah. yeah. And I'm not prepared to be breathing and for others to feel so alone and isolated, given the similarities of lots of our stories. Yeah. So I talk about it openly and publicly with a strength and, you know, a health and wealth now that I did not have when I was 38. Um, so that was tough. But, you know, I, I've been really, really fortunate. I have had so much love and support. But there's a saying, I don't know, I don't, is the word ass a swear word? No. <laughs> <laughs> there's a saying which goes, you can't save your face and your ass at the same time. Right. Right. And when I was 24, I chose to save my ass because I was just absolutely smashed with all the drinking and drug taking and, you know, the, the crazy behaviours, the dangerous behaviours I was getting up to. Um, so I got sober in New Zealand and then a few years later, um, I was 28 actually, and I remember very clearly, I was, I, it was a Saturday morning in October 2002, and I woke up the Saturday. It was a perfectly beautiful, sunny New Zealand day. The birds were chirping. And it was like early, early in the morning. And I had this thought, I was like, oh my God, I could stay here in New Zealand doing the same job in the same place for the rest of my life. And that thought terrified me. <laughs> so I resigned from my job on Monday. I bought a one-way ticket to London to leave in the January that same week. Um, and I came to, came to the UK uh, January 2003. Wow. Wow, right? And you've lived here ever since. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I have. So that's what brought me to yeah. the UK. I was bored and terrified that things would just stay the same. Right. Yeah. I think in hindsight, I can now see there was a whole lot more going on yeah. with, with the backstory yeah. I just touched on briefly. Um, but yeah, it's been quite, quite, a, quite a ride. Yeah, I think what you say about people falling into substance abuse is so true and so unrecognized that it starts out with, I'm not having a good day. Let me just take a quick drink. It'll make mm -hmm. me, it'll help me get through the day. Right. And, and, you know, I do believe that anybody that enjoys an occasional drink, you know, mm. there's no harm in it whatsoever. Mm. No, but when no. it becomes a dependency, mm. uh, you know, that, that, that shot of something in the evening or the glass of wine or a hit on something that somebody might do just to ease the pain, just to ease the tension. And then it gets worse and then it mm. just fulfills it, and then it becomes yeah. a dependency. Yeah. And it's that self-medication. Mm. And, and, and I think lots of us use different addictions to numb, run, and escape yeah. the pain of the past. Yeah. And I know that's certainly my story and people that I've worked with within, within my coaching work, that's just a theme that runs right throughout. And it doesn't matter the flavor of the addiction. Mm -hmm. The root cause is quite often very, very similar to the next person. But because there is a stigma around uh, alcoholism and drug abuse, mental health stuff as well, throw on, on top of that anything to do with LGBT, mm -hmm. people of colour or the BAME community, um, domestic violence, yeah. the, uh, anything you add on is a whole other layer of complexity that yeah. needs support to deal with. Yeah, yeah. And so when you first arrived in London, did you feel you were giving life a whole new fresh start? Oh. Did you find it easy to do that because you're in a different place? I did, did not that? find it easy. Okay. It was a, a huge culture shock. I say to people still, the thing that people don't understand between New Zealand and the UK is we speak the same language almost. Because while English is the common language, how we use it yeah. and our intention and our transparency is totally different. Yeah. You know, Australasians are known for being quite direct and forthright and this is uh -huh. it. Whereas I've kind of experienced in the UK, that's not how people operate quite a lot of the time. They say one thing and mean something totally different. Right. You yeah. know, especially face to face, everything's quite lovely. Yeah. And then when it's not there. <laughs> so the cultural shock for me was massive. And I, I'd never experienced homesickness. Yeah. And for the first 10 months of being here in London, I was so homesick. Yeah. I missed so much, but I couldn't name it until it passed. I was like, oh my yeah. gosh, it's a form of depression. Yeah. And it was heavy. Yeah, and quite a paradox there because you were glad to be away, but you missed it at the same time. Yes. And that's, that's a really... Yes. And again, it's not really recognizing it. And that's one no. of the key things about mental illness is yeah. not 
understanding what's going on, understanding yeah. how you feel. A uh, funny thing you should say about language is that um, I found the same thing when I moved to New York. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'd, I'd been to the US as a visitor a couple of times, but then when I went to live there, and I say to people, I moved from London to New York, and I had a language problem. Right, yeah. And the problem was people didn't understand me. I would say things, and I'd get this, uh, I'd get these blank looks, because people didn't understand my terminology, phraseology, until you start using the different words. Mm -hmm. And of course, mm -hmm. New Yorkers are like very assertive, and they're loud, and I was not naturally an assertive, loud person. I had to learn to do that. So there's this big cultural thing, even though you think you're moving somewhere with the yeah. common language. Mm -hmm. um, yes, you don't have to learn the grammar of another language, but you have to learn how to speak like the locals, mm. and that doesn't always come naturally. No, I'm still very much a foreigner in the yeah. UK. Yeah. I think I will be till the day I die. And I like, I like being a foreigner, because people don't necessarily think of white people as being foreigners in another white culture. I'm such a foreigner here. Yeah. And one of the things I f still find really challenging is the way things happen in the UK is so culturally different to mm -hmm. how I grew up in New Zealand. Right. New Zealand takes pride in its country and its environment and looks after it. And then when I came here to the UK, particularly in London, the way people just commonly disrespect their environment and their services and people, I was horrified. Mm. It's like, how could you... How could you do that to your own country and your community after a football match, whether you win or lose? Right. How right. can you behave in such a, a like a basic way? Yeah. Whereas I, I, I've never ever seen anything like it, and yeah. it still horrifies me. Yeah. And I mean, I'm a British citizen for the passport, but I, well, no, it's just a no. It's not anything I really want to be associated with. But I am by proxy, if you like. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, again, I feel we could probably debate this for many hours, but as a US citizen, a naturalized US citizen, the last thing I want in my life or anybody's life is a gun. Right. And yet that is such a big thing with so mm. many Americans is, is the right to bear arms. Mm. And it, it's a huge thing that's dividing the country right now. Yeah. But uh, we, we, yeah. we don't need to be political <laughs> today. <laughs> um, so, 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 Patrick, tell me a little bit about uh, your coaching business. So what got right. you into that? What was the, the genesis of that? Well, again, actually, it was boredom. I So I'd been in education for 20 years and I you know, taught uh, primary school children or elementary school kids in New Zealand and here in London. And um, I'd done most jobs in schools across the senior leadership team. Um, and I was just bored of the meetings after meeting yeah. where there was not much... Uh, not very many new exciting initiatives that were sustainable. And education, I think, anywhere is a tricky, stressful environment to work mm -hmm. in. Um, and I said to my boss, um, oh, I can't remember when that was, I said, look, I'm going to step out of the leadership team. He said, what do you mean? I said, I'm bored. He said, but we can find... I said, no. What I want to do is I only want to work with my colleagues to improve their... Uh, well-being and their teaching and learning and then that will obviously have a knock-on effect to the kids and so he said so how are you going to do this I said look I'm already doing it in mentor you know, mentoring colleagues but I want to add in more coaching to that so I read two books <laughs> and then I just started doing it from what I'd learned and what I'd seen and experienced um, with coaching I'd experienced and then at the end of that year the, the school um, gave me a pay increase and a few thousand pounds towards my training. And so, yeah, that was, that was how it started really. Cause, and what happened as a result of that year of me just doing that work was the school got the best outcomes they'd ever had mm -hmm. because of, well, they attributed a lot of it to the work I was doing right. with the colleagues. And um, yeah, and then, I, so I started my, my own business back then. And yeah, it's just grown and grown. And, and over the years, what's happened because of my backstory and where my passion lies on working with people, you know, if you want to get, get really good uh, or get better at managing your time, that sort of coaching does not interest me. Transactional coaching mm -hmm. I find quite dull. I'm much more interested in transformational coaching where we look at the whole person, what's going on, where you're at, whatever it is. And that's why the tagline uh, in my business is, you know, coaching people in and through the harder times of life right. because that's where we all need more support. Yeah. And it's that sort of support that really inspires me and excites me because 
who I am and how I am. I work with a huge amount of heart. You know, there is the business side, but sometimes that's yeah. this. Yeah. You know, you've got to distance yourself a little bit. But yeah, who I am is much more interested in who you are. Right. Yeah. And what do you want to create that's new or different for you? So yeah. you live and perform in a much more efficient, healthier way. Yeah. You know, I call that what you can't learn in a textbook. Right. Because. Uh, you know, I have a background in finance, and if there was an area of finance that I was unfamiliar with, an area of accounting that I was unfamiliar with, I can get a textbook. I can learn mm. it. I can learn a technical skill. Right. I could. I could branch into a different profession. I could mm. learn something, and I could hire a tutor to teach me the technical skill. My kids needed tutoring mm. with subject matter. I can hire a tutor for the right. subject matter, but. The stuff you don't learn in the textbook, which is really, you know, the communication, the self soul searching, the thinking process of what it is that you want to do, what makes you happy, what doesn't make you happy. And I think that it's funny, circling back on what you said at the very beginning was when you looked at, I could be in this light, in this, where I am today, I could be there for the rest of my life. And you found that scary. Mm -hmm. Some people will find that very comforting and that works mm. for some people. So it's really a case of figuring out where you fit and yeah. what you want to do. Yeah, for, well for me, there's got to be a level of challenge and excitement. Yeah. Because I, I need to be growing and feeling my way forward in new ways with new people. Like, you know, meeting you today in person uh, for the first time, that excites me. Meeting new people and seeing how they are and who they are and what goes on in their mind really, really excites me. Here's a little example of why I do what I do. So I've been sober a long, long time. Across the 22 years I've been sober, I've worked with hundreds, hundreds and hundreds of people uh, with different addictions. Um, mm. My favorite sort of coaching is when people are in really, really tough places in life for whatever yeah. reason, whether it's divorce or separation or illness or whatever. Um, and I had a client um, two weeks ago who and it was our fourth session together. And he said to me, I need to tell you something really important. And I said, okay, of course. He said, this is the first day that I haven't been high in 10 years. Wow, really? And I said to him, okay. He said, how are you feeling? He said, I'm really, really proud. He said, but I needed those first three sessions to work out whether I was safe enough or not hmm. to tell you of the problem I was having. That's one person yeah. who's been high for 10 years, who has his first day off it, and shares that with me. I was the first person who told. Ah. What's nice. the impact gonna be? Who knows whether you know, that leads to longer term sobriety or not, but that's the power of yeah. just sitting and being with, with no pressure, no expectation or demand. It's right. a totally different way of listening and yeah. being. And no judgment, you know. It's, oh, okay. that's, that's I mean, the, it would be ironic thing. if I judged anyone, <laughs> wouldn't it? Given, <laughs> but I think because most clients I work with know some of my backstory. Yeah. They know there's another layer of safety because who would I be to judge anyway? I'm not right. interested in judging. What I'm interested in is what's really useful for you. Yeah. What can I give you or provide here that will help you get to where you want to go. Right, yeah. And I, when we started that session, I had no clue. Yeah. He didn't appear like he'd been high for the previous yeah. three. So that's why I love what I do. Yeah. I love the unpredictability. I love that I can't prepare in as much as how do you prepare for that? Right. You just go you don't with know it's it. coming. No, you have no clue. No you've got some basic tools. You've got some really great, you know, powerful tools. But the most important tool actually is just all of this. Yeah. It's not anything I can learn in a book. Uh, yeah. Like yeah. you said. Yeah. So, so Patrick, that your background in, in teaching, coaching, and all of these things that you've done clearly equips you for something like Mendable, mm. because it really plays into yeah. the same type of mission. 
So um, circling back on Mendable, so it is a, a new concept, it's a new business. Mm -hmm. So the way I look at it is it's entrepreneurship because it's a startup company, you're yep. starting a company, mm -hmm. and it is the, the great mission of doing something very public spirited and providing a, mm -hmm. a much needed service to people that mm -hmm. need it. Yeah. So, um, so where is everything at today? I mean, it, right. it, so it hasn't, the app hasn't launched yet, no. is it right? Okay. There, there are there are six of us who have the test flight app on mm -hmm. our phone. So we're testing. We are putting new uh, ideas and tools together, which we're working on all the time. Um, we are currently seeking investment, because mm -hmm. obviously a startup company needs capital to get going. Um, but that's, at the moment, that's not stopping us. We just keep building, because what we're after is we're after a first, first release. Where are we at now? Probably, probably January, mm -hmm. actually. Um, so we're going to put together, I call it an MVP, a minimal viable product, mm -hmm. to to be released. And yeah, it's it's ticking along and it's ticking forward. And it's super exciting to have an app on my phone that I'm helping build live. And just like you know, when you build yeah. a website, sitting for hours, working on yeah. one slide of the app, similar sort of software to you know, uh, website development. It's a real buzz. Yeah, it's yeah. a real buzz. But even more so, it's not just the app. It's this is going to have an immediate positive impact on millions of people's lives. We know it's going to be huge because no one has got this technology. No one's done it. Yeah. And that alone is fun. Um, it feels like when you first open it, it feels like, oh, this is exciting because the metrics measure stuff from your body that will then have an impact, an output and suggest right. different tools for you to use to manage your stress or your anxiety and, and yeah, with immediate effect. Yeah. I think it's worth giving some acknowledgement to Sophia May, who oh, is the co-CEO. And she actually is a mental health nurse she in, is. as a profession. Mm -hmm. So, um, so to what extent has she used her medical training, anatomical training and... Well, that's a really good question. I'll tell you something really special about Sophia is the package of who she is. But the, the, the best thing about her, and I've said this to her before, you know, we, you know, as an educator, people talk about intelligence this and intelligence that and, you know, IQ scores and la la. Her super intelligence is networking. Mm. The way she builds relationships with heart and purposefulness is exceptional. Um, and actually, that was why, when we had our initial conversation, uh, when Sophia said, "Would you, you know, would you be interested in working with me and the team on this?" I said yes straight away mm. because I could, I, I knew we were aligned in our values and what we wanted to achieve individually and then collectively. Um, her, her mental health nursing is obviously a massive part of it because obviously everything that we're putting into the app has to have an output and an outcome that's purposeful for the consumer. Right. And if it hasn't, it's not going in. Yeah. Because that's just a waste of space, time, and money. So, yeah, it's, and it's interesting. We've got uh, a doctor in the team. He's also an engineer and inventor. Mm. Um, and his brother is writing the code. And then there's me, who was a teacher and now a coach. And Sophia, who's a mental health nurse and founder and co-CEO of this. So when you look at, and, and also Sophia's of mixed race, English, Jamaican mix. I'm a foreigner living here in the UK. I'm gay. The two brothers in Canada. So when we come together in a Zoom call. Um, <laughs> You're a melting pot. <laughs> we are. And there's other people, you know, there's a real mix yeah. of diversity. And I said, while, you know, while initially we were... Uh, wanting to pitch and target towards men only, I said, we cannot, we cannot do that. Well, that's not true. We can. I said, I don't think it'd be wise to, given yeah. mental health is mental health. Right. Sure, there might be gender-specific things, but generally speaking, anxiety and depression is universal. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, it, it's really exciting. And, and I said to the, the, we keep talking about ideas, ideas, ideas. I've got this like one document, it's just ideas, because they just keep on coming. And then I go, yeah, that's great. And I get back to those three, right? Um, the, only, the only stupid idea is the one you don't share. Mm -hmm. Because every single idea has a, a ripple and knock on effect and it gets this conversation going. And we just end up going to these whole other places that are so creative yeah. and exciting 
And you yeah. just think, oh, wow, what an amazing bunch of people. Yeah. And, and you are talking exactly any exciting startup company. That's, mm. that's exactly where it is. And I think you know I was one of the early employees at PayPal. Yeah. And, um, and one of the things that really changed my life and the way I think about things, and you may hear this as well from time to time as things develop for Mendable, but when we were creating the PayPal product, which was very revolutionary and changed the way that people make payments, mm -hmm. and I would tell people about it, and they say, what, what's this company you're working for? What are you doing? And I explain what PayPal was all about. So many people said, but you can't do that. They say, why not? Because it's never been done before. And that mm. just excited me even more because, right. okay, all of, and anything, any of the big name companies, technology companies that are out there today, of which we could name many, they all started somewhere mm -hmm. and they all started doing something new mm. and they all saw a need and whether you're doing it for public service, public spiritedness, profit, whatever, there's a need and there's something that you can do and it hasn't been done before. So mm. if it hasn't been done before, maybe now is the time to do it. Right. There, there is that thing, and I know you will have seen this before, where there's that thinking of um, it's never been done before. And then that awful thing that I hear sometimes, that, but we've always done it this way. Yeah. And if I ever hear that, <laughs> it, it like physically hurts me because it's like, well... Slavery was always done too, yeah. yeah. until it was challenged and changed. So yeah, that sort of thinking riles me. Yeah, because I'm yeah. just like, oh, I can't, I can't look at you. Yeah, and once again, not to bring politics into it, but political thinking. How many people vote the way they do because they always have? They never right. really even thought. Mm. Maybe I'm not as strongly this way or whatever, right. but. It's, you know, I always did. My parents voted that way. I voted right. that way. So many people would, would not really think about what is their true conviction. Right. And thinking is what this whole conversation yeah. really is all about. Because yes. we're thinking about mental health. It's learning new behaviours or different behaviours and taking action to use the mind to direct the thinking yeah. rather than the mind managing itself really badly. Yeah. Thinking requires energy and different actions. Yeah. Because otherwise... We will, we will continue to vote. We will continue to behave how we've always behaved because the brain is lazy and will always go to the fastest, most established neurological pathway. So if we're yeah. thinking about creating and maintaining new mental health or better mental health, we have to do something differently. Yeah, yeah, great. And that's where something like Mendable comes in. So, yeah. so, so Patrick, do you ever see a day when you and Sophia quit your day jobs and work full time for Mendable? Yes, 100%. 100% I do. Um, I said to Sophia when we started uh, working together, I said, I will not stop coaching because mm -hmm. that's my first passion. Right. I, and even if I'm coaching other members of the team, I, I love it so much that it has to be a part of my life yeah. because it is the most perfectly tailored suit for this guy. Yeah. Working for myself and my coaching business is like... I've designed the suit, chosen the fabric, sewn it together, and I get to wear it every day. And I was going to, I was going to a new client meeting. I, I met a friend for breakfast, and I was going to a new client meeting. And my friend said, you, you're meeting a client like that? And I was dressed pretty much like mm -hmm. this. And I said, yeah, because I now know that all of this is the USP. Whereas for a lot of my life, I was wanting to be like something I thought you wanted me to be. Right. And that's not what works. It doesn't work. You've yeah. got to be all of yourself if you're going to front up anywhere. Yeah, yeah. And, and make the other person feel safe with you. And if mm. they see the real you, mm. that's likely to make them feel mm. more safe. Yeah, and what's interesting about meeting new people is you can see their safety or lack of it in their eyes yeah. straight away. Because if you maintain eye contact with compassion and a genuine kind of heartfeltness, right. you can see whether they can accept it and receive it or not. And um, I, it's one of the things I love about my work because a lot of my listening is actually just looking at your eyes mm -hmm. to see if you're still thinking because mm. the eyes always keep moving right. when you're thinking. Yeah, yeah. And, and that um, another communication thing is, is listening skills because um, you know, I've seen people that when you're talking to them, if they're looking around, they might be listening to you, but I don't think they're listening to me because if you don't have the eye contact, if the eyes are averted, you just don't get that same connection. Mm. Well, you're right. So w when, when I'm meeting a friend, for example, I always have my back to the street 
so that I don't have all that visual stuff distracting me. But what's also interesting is with clients when they're thinking is, so they're talking about an issue, their eyes will quite often look up and around and then come back because the brain's doing its thing. Uh, and I, I love that aspect of listening, of just being still and silent. And I quite often say to people, yeah, really good listening doesn't involve your mouth. Right. Yeah, good point. And just leaving silence in conversation, like really good listening conversation. Yeah. People aren't used to it. Yeah. And also the world that's developed in the last year and a half or so with mm. distance, Zoom calls, mm. lack of personal communication and pers meeting in person. Mm. I think we've lost a lot of that. And it's, it's yes, you can, you can look at somebody on a screen and you can still see them look at you, but I don't think you get that true body language. Well, it's interesting. Some, what I discovered really early on in the, in the pandemic was that I could achieve the same thing on Zoom as I can in person. You, you miss some of the body language, but for lots of people, it adds a layer of emotional safety for mm. them, particularly the sorts of clients that I work with, because we're not in the same space. And if safety right. is an issue for them, particularly if they're having a hard time, they'll be in their own safe environment, assuming it is safe. Um, so meeting someone for the first time to discuss something quite yeah. hard is much easier for them in that way. Yeah, yeah. So Patrick, great stuff going on. Mm -hmm. um, if anybody watching is interested in helping Mendable, yeah. becoming a part of Mendable, what's the best way for them to do that? The best way would be to get hold of us through our website, which is Mendable. Mendable.app. Mendable.app, thank you. <laughs> that was awkward. Um, and the email address for that is mendable.app at gmail.com. Yeah, great. There you go. And um, anything else you'd like to add? No, just thank you. And I, I'm really grateful for this opportunity to, to meet you in person yeah. and just to chat about the stuff that we're really excited about in life and working with others. Yeah. And um, can I just tell everybody about the clubhouse room? Yeah, um, of course. Can I do the times? Can you? Did you write them down? No, I have not got them written down. Look, nothing is written down. Do you know the times? So I'm going to try. Oh my God. I'm going to try. So there is this great clubhouse room. If you're not a member of clubhouse, um, it's pretty easy to get onto it. And uh, Mondays and Thursdays, there is this room of testimony to men's mental health. And US, North America, 9 a.m. Hawaii, 12, 12 p.m. Pacific, 1 p.m. Mountain, 2 p.m. Central, 3 p.m. Eastern, 8 p.m. UK, 9 p.m. Central European, 1 a.m. India, 5 a.m. Eastern Australia, 7 a.m. New Zealand. Wow. I've been listening, you see? Wow. <laughs> Until daylight savings ends. Yes, I was going to say that. In about a month, a yeah. month or two from now, yeah. everything's going to change because, um, well, Northern Hemisphere, UK and Europe and US will be on the, the same times, but um, it's going to shift when Southern Hemisphere goes Correct. onto daylight savings, Northern Hemisphere Correct. comes off. So there'll be an adjustment there. But Well done. Anyway, thank you. That's very impressive. <laughs> thank you, David. So, well, thanks again, Patrick, for joining me today and for sharing all of these wonderful things, not just about your background and your coaching business, but also about the work that's going on at Mendable. And, uh, and I look forward to following the success. Thanks very much. And thanks everyone for watching. If you enjoyed this video, please leave your comments below, subscribe to our channel. You'll find contact information below for Patrick and for Mendable. And uh, thanks for watching. Be well and see you next time. We upload a We Do Talk every week. So if you enjoyed this one, please subscribe and leave your comments below.